I ask you all to be upstanding, to give a massive warm welcome to Mr. Paul Jason Statham of Property Development <laughs> Hints. Thank you, everybody. To swap to that one, uh, it'll just be all the tab. There you go. If you want, please stay to the side. Okie dokie, right, hello. hello. That's, um, yeah. yeah, Jason Statham, what's all that now? So, um, <coughs> before I start, let's uh, call. Oh, I'll tell you. Who's, um, uh, what are you doing in property at the moment? So could you say a quick hands up if you're like sort of beginning, starting out, fairly newish? Okay. Um, fairly experienced, done quite a lot? Okay, so I'm guessing everything else is a bit in between. Okie dokie. All right, so look, today I'm going to talk about uh, property development, but particularly um, site finding and um, uh, sorting land basically because that's really where, where it all starts so it doesn't matter how much you know how long you've been doing it how good you are with the rest of the stuff until you've got the site until you've got the building until you've got the opportunity effectively the canvas to work with you can't do anything so um, I'm mainly going to talk about um, finding off-market deals okay that's the way that the property development industry really works um, is based on proper off-market deals that, that's that's really what we all want and even if you're doing um, perhaps smaller stuff, like you're just you know, looking for little houses to do up to start with, that's how I started off, or you're um, doing HMOs, whatever you're doing, really, the, what you really need to be doing, in my opinion, is finding proper off-market deals, okay? Because, almost by definition, when stuff's on the market, there's going to be massive competition, the price gets bid, gets, gets bid up, so the only way you buy it is being the person that pays the most, yeah? Paying the most for stuff is not very clever business. So, I should add actually, this is, this is the first time I've actually um, spoken out like this for a couple of years. So, uh, <coughs> I've only done these slides today and I haven't seen them, for, um, I've seen them for about five minutes. So, if I sound like I'm making it up as I go along, right? Because I'm making it up as I go along. <laughs> <coughs> so, right. So you may or may not know that um, there is a big uh, central government push to support and encourage SME house builders and developers, okay? So basically, since um, 1988, or when the statistics started, which funnily, co coincidentally enough was when I did my first new build development, since 1988 um, and until last year when these statistics came out, uh, the number of SME developers, an, S an SME developer, depending on how you count it, are people doing between one, some, some, some of the statistics count between one and a hundred units, some of them count between one and a thousand units, okay? So smaller developers are like really, really small to fairly big. When you're doing a thousand units, that's, that's not small, yeah? But that, but that SME developers. So since 1988 to last year, SME developers went from 12,500 to less than 3,000. So massive, massive drop in SME developers. Um, and not surprisingly, at the same time, that's one of the reasons there's been a, a massive slowdown in, in the supply of housing. Yeah? You've got more people, if you know, you've got less people around able to, to, to do the building and supply them, of course, less of them and get, get supplied. And most of that, the reason for that, is, is because the, the, um, the planning system got more and more complex since 1988. Yeah? So central government have realised that yeah, that's a, one of the things holding back the supply of new, new housing. So they've done a whole load of surveys. NHBC Foundation did a su survey, um, I keep saying last year, 17, but not quite last year, um, into the biggest barriers to growth for, for small developers. And this is what they discovered. So first, 37% of them said it was to do with the cost and the availability of viable land. 38% of them said it was problems with the planning um, system, and the remaining 20% said it was the availability of finance. Yeah? And so, so I can tell you now, that's, that's not just the biggest problem for SME developers, that's the biggest problem for all developers. Yeah? So I used to be head of land, 
the Barrett's the biggest developer in the country. It's, it's exactly the same for them. Land, land and planning are the big problems in development, yeah? Um, although, interestingly, when you find the right land um, in the right way and you get the right planning for it, the, the finance tends not to be a problem. Yeah? <coughs> Financing good deals where you've added a load of value um, is, isn't difficult, yeah? Financing shit deals that are a pile of crap, then that is a problem, yeah? So, quite rightly, yeah? so, so you won't, you'll never have a problem financing good deals. Unless it's 2008 or 2009 when it's pretty much the end of the world and no one's got any money, most of the time, if they're, if they're good deals, you will still get them funded, one way or another, yeah? So, let me show you how it all really works. Let me just move this over here a bit so you can all see this, right? So, uh, right, but the reason you can sometimes make a lot of money in property development um, is because it's high risk, high reward, yeah? So it's si simple as that. If it was simple, if it was easy, everyone would do it, yeah? The reason there is potentially a ton of money in property development, if and when you know what you're doing, is because it's so risky. So, like any business, it's a case of balancing risk against reward. So, risk is effectively how much time, money, and expertise you need, uh, and reward is obviously how much how much money you can make. Yeah? And, <coughs> and, and usually, in most things. The, the, the further you go down the process, the riskier it gets, the more money you, you could potentially make to start, um, you know, to compensate yourself. So, in property development, it works like this. Everything starts with land. So land means, that doesn't just mean like farms and fields and bare land. Like this, is, this is land, your house is land, my house is land. Basically everything is, is land. And, and most of the time in development, we're talking about brownfield land. So, so there'll be it's something that's already got a building on there, yeah? So everything starts with land. It starts with finding the opportunity to start with. Then, the, the really clever bit that adds massive value to land is planning and then at the end of the process you build things to either sell or which is the traditional developers model build to sell or to perhaps refinance and hold for your own portfolio which is effectively build to rent prs whatever, whatever you want to call it yeah but so remember this is remember this this scale here is reward and this and this and this is risk yeah so if you were to plot on, on this scale sort of how much money could be made at the various stages, this is how it works, yeah? So the, the quickest, easiest money is finding real off-market opportunities and then introducing them to other people. That's, that's the way the development land market really works, yeah? So typically, you find a site off-market, you introduce it to a developer, they will pay you 2% of the land value. Okay, so if it's only a little site, they buy it for a million quid, they'll pay you a 20 grand fee. Most, most of my stuff is in London and the home <coughs> counties where you don't get much land for a million quid. Most, most of the stuff I'm doing is two, three, four, five, six million quid, so 20, 40, 50, 100 grand fees is, is normal in introduction fees. That's just how the land market works, yeah? It's not out of the ordinary, it's that's like how it works every day of the week. So, quickest and easiest money is in finding development opportunities and introduce them to other people, yeah? The, 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 the really, really big money in development is securing those opportunities yourself, I, I, ideally in a way that de-risks the deal as much as possible. So even, even now, 65% of my deals are, are done on one pound option agreements, okay? so. The really clever money is in securing those deals and then knowing how to add massive value to them through good planning and design. So this, this bit here, this is where the really, really clever money in development is made. And then the, the end bit, building stuff, is, is actually the riskiest part of the whole process. Yeah? That's, that, that, that's the riskiest, most time consuming part of the whole process. So, 
Uh, most people, I think, when they think about property development, a lot of people, they're, they're literally looking at the whole process through the, through the wrong end of the telescope. You know, you talk about development and they think about building sites and tower cranes and stuff like that, which is part of the process, but it's, it's, it's actually not the most important part of the process. Yeah, you've got to know how to do it right, but um, it's all of, all of the, the clever money is, is made here, yeah? Land and planning. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and I'll, I'll tell you how I know this. So, I, so, so basically, I, I found it out this the hard way. So, when I, how I got started, so I'm not an architect, by the way. Um, I'm not a planner either. I'm gonna tell you this story because uh, people, people keep saying, oh, you're a planning bloke, aren't you? I'm not a planning bloke. Uh, well, actually, I'm, I'm a chartered planning and development player, but I'm not a planner. Most planners, have got any planners in? Right, force collect planners on. <laughs> so uh, there's nothing wrong with planners, but mo most planners tend to be a little bit nerdy, right? I like to think that's that's not me. So I, I'm not a planner. I'm just someone that realised that planning was the most important important part of development. Yeah. So I tried to make myself an expert on that. So. Basically what happened is when, when I was a kid I didn't know what I wanted, wanted to do, I messed around at school, didn't take any exams, so not surprisingly um, found myself cleaning the box on the building site. <laughs> so, but I was, I was very good at it, so I soon got promoted to digging holes. So <clears throat> I remember one day was um, November, I can't even remember what year it was, 1983 I think I'm going to guess. <clears throat> I was down a hole on this, on this building site, freezing cold. Um, making a roll up, that was in the days when smoking was still good for you. <laughs> so I'm down the hole making a roll up, all of a sudden there's a big commotion and um, all my bosses like the site managers start running around all panicking. So I'm just sitting down the, down the hole like wondering what's going on. A couple of Range Rovers pull in the gates, um, guys get out in flash suits, all my bosses run over get these umbrellas out because it's raining and like basically kissing these guys arses. And I remember thinking, blimey, that's good. I don't, I don't know what they do, but whatever it is, they're obviously in the right place. I'm clearly in the wrong place. That's what I want to do, yeah? So I decided, that's when I decided I wanted to be a property developer. So then I thought property development was all about construction. So I thought, right, I've got to learn everything about construction. So to cut a very long story short, I, I eventually wangled myself um, a job as a, um, I'm not going to, who knows what a chain boy is? Only one, good. It's not as kinky as it sounds, right? <laughs> a chain boy, what happens is, is years and years ago, a chain is a unit of measurement, yeah? When, when people were building roads, they used to lay out chains from one point to another to, to, to set out roads, yeah? The chain boy was basically the, the engineer, civil engineer's labourer that used to carry these big heavy, heavy chains, yeah? So the name, the name stuff. So basically, I, I got a job as a, as a site engineer's assistant banging in the pegs and doing stuff like that yeah but then because um, I was really keen and I wanted to learn I was asking a lot of questions all the rest of it they eventually said to me look do you want to sort of go to college part-time to, to become a, a trainee site engineer so I said yeah, yeah yeah definitely so that's what I did so so from 16 to 21 I studied construction management I became a trainee site engineer then I became a site engineer then I eventually became an assistant site manager and a site manager by the time I was 21 so I spent the first five years of my career learning as much as possible about construction because I thought property development was all about construction yeah and then evening evenings and weekends I was doing houses up with a, a mate of mine a mate of mine was a bricklayer so when we were 17 we bought our first little deal we bought an old house it was a bit of a wreck did it up sold it made a few quid did another one did another one started getting a bit more adventurous bought one that required a whole ton more work eventually got a bit more adventurous bought a house and split it into flats. So probably from, from the age of like 17 to about, about 20, 21, probably did about six or seven sort of smallish reverby type development deals, yeah? And until 1988, which as I mentioned earlier, was when I, I built my first little house, my first new build deal. However, the, throughout that period, we were buying sites, well, buildings really, either um, from estate agents or in the auction. Okay, so, so basically on the market, okay? Now, even so, like, things were very, very different then. So like in, in, in like the early 80s, you could, get, you could still get deals at auctions, right? Auctions were very, very different today to the way they are, they are now. 
now since homes under the hammer right it, the auctions are, are full of people a lot of whom don't know what they're doing yeah which is which is basically the worst the worst thing you, you can come across because you're competing against people that are getting their numbers wrong and paying too much so um I, I haven't bought anything in an auction for about 25 years. I've sold things in auctions, yeah, but, but you very, very rarely get auctions, um, get deals in the auction. Now, it never used to be like that. You still used to get a few deals. So, anyway, but the point is, we were buying things that were on the market or in the market. Until, um, and then all of a sudden, in my little patch, like where we grew up in West London, so we were sort of doing all of the things in the same area. Every now and then, there'd be we'd see something getting refurbed or, or something getting built that, that, that wasn't hadn't been with an estate agent and it hadn't been um, in the auction. Otherwise, we would have seen it yet. So it's like blindly, how how did that happen? So we started investigating into the basically like how did we miss that one? Yeah, and I then started becoming aware of the concept of off-market deals, proper off-market deals. Yeah. So a proper off-market deal is, is literally when, when you spot something that looks like it might have potential and you then approach, you know, you find out, you do a land register search, that's fairly easy, you find out who owns it, you then approach them in a very specific way to get a foot in the door before they're before they even thinking about putting it on, on the market, yeah? So that's, that, that's the only real proper off-market deal. So I so started, started doing that. At the same time, well, not, not long after, I also um, discovered a book called Big Profits from Building Plots, right? It, it, it doesn't exist anymore. Um, but what that was about was basically option agreements. So for, for the first time also, I read, I read this book, because there was no training or anything in those days, okay? So, that, so all you could do, was, which is what I did do, was read um, like quite dense textbooks, land economics books, planning books, building books. Every, I basically read everything I could, but there wasn't really any proper training. Now there's loads of stuff everywhere. So this book, anyway, was about option agreements. So for me, it was a massive eye-opener when I discovered there was like a legal way of controlling land, sometimes with just a pound, legal consideration, without having to buy it. So I, I then spent the next few years going around trying to do one pound option deals on bigger sites that I didn't have enough, I couldn't afford to buy, but obviously I could afford to tie up on a one pound option um, by approaching off market deals in a very specific way. But I didn't really know what I was doing because I had no one to learn from, it was all trial and error. Um, so 95% plus of them I balls up because I didn't know what I was doing, but a couple of them actually come off. So I, I did, a, made, did a few little deals, made a few quid. But, because I wanted to do sort of bigger and better things, I, I eventually realised that the, the only way I'm going to um, be able to, to to get the knowledge and experience that I want um, if I if I'm really working for someone else for for a big developer or something like that. So I uh, did a whole load of research in terms of what do I really need to learn, what's the best thing to study came to the conclusion that um, development is really all about land so I needed to get myself a job as a land buyer and worked out that the best thing to study to get myself as a job land, as a land buyer was a thing called land economics. So I went and studied land economics, eventually became a chartered <coughs> planning and development surveyor, um, all with a view to getting a, a job as a, a, a land buyer in a big developer, which I did. Because the reason it's, it's the most important part of the whole development process, yeah? So I I ended up at, at Barrett's, the biggest developer in the country, who currently build, I think, about 17,000 houses a year, yeah? But Barrett's, big house builders like that, they're basically just building machines, okay? What happens is, land goes in one end, <coughs> and houses and flats come out the other. That That is basically at its height. So well, that's, that's how development works, yeah? Now, the, all, knowing how to do all of this bit is massively, massively important, obviously, but the point is, it all starts with land. Land, buildings, the opportunity is the most important part of the whole process. Um, so as a result, you, as a, if you're a good land buyer, you are massively, massively valuable because, you know, if, if someone like me does not, isn't, isn't constantly feeding the machine with land and plan vision, everyone's sat, everyone's got to go home. Which is why you'll find most MDs and most chairmen of house builders are ex-land guys. 
because to be really good at that stuff, you it, it, everything sort of works backwards and translates it down to doing the deal. Yeah. In order to do the right land deals, you have to understand about building, you have to understand about planning, you have to understand about design. That's how you work backwards. That that tells you how and where to find the right land and what you can pay for it. Does that make sense? So, and it, and it's the same even on a even on a very very small scale. Um, you know, if you're same as me, you, yeah, you, you're finding if you if you're starting out and you just want to find a single house, a single plot, or whatever, or even a smaller refurb deal, it all it all starts with finding that right deal. Because if you if you if you find the wrong deals and you're buying things that are on the market and you're paying too much for them and you're almost by definition you're going to be because because the price is going to be bid up against the competition, you're sort of on the back foot to start with, yeah. And, but what happens is probably two thirds, three quarters of the time, the market's sort of going up, and even when people pay too much and screw up, the market sort of get, gets them out of the shit. That, that, that's all that happens, seriously. If you watch things like Homes Under the Hammer, um, what is it, who's the other one as well? Is it Sarah Beanie? I don't know, I don't watch that stuff. But, uh, but you know, like, People, they would have made more money if they didn't do anything. It, it's, it was the market that made the money, not not them, yeah? So basically the market gets people out of the ship most of the time, but if it does, then that's, that's luck, um, but it won't always. And now, Brexit, uncertain, market going a bit sideways and the rest of it, it, it definitely won't happen. So I'm fairly sure, that I reckon there'll, there'll be more developers and property people going bust this year than at any time since the recession, Al almost guaranteed. It started happening already. I don't know if you've like heard about. I'm aware of funders and banks and mortgages and stuff like that pulling the plug on pe people already in, in terms of loans. Right? And and things haven't even got bad. Things things aren't. Th there's nothing bad about the market now. It's just like normal, really. So, I mean, if you were developing or doing stuff in think times like 2008 when the market was bad you know what a, what a real crash does, then um, it's serious. So, so this is how I know. And anyway, and so I, I in, in um, 2008, which I've uh, very carefully not put on there, because it <laughs> makes me cry, right? All my stuff was funded, well actually, I, I had six biggish development deals on, on the go. Five of them were funded by RBS. Right, so that's that's a mistake, by the way. So um, all the RBS ones, they're all really good deals, all high margin, but basically all the banks ran out of money, so they couldn't afford to carry on funding stuff. They would look for any and every opportunity they could to pull the plug, which they did. All the RBS ones, um, I got got the plug pulled on them. I, I pretty much lost everything that I'd earned over the previous ten years. And one that didn't get the plug pulled on me, that was funded by Close Brothers, who were a different type of bank. And uh, and I had a couple of deals at various stages in the pipeline that that sort of hadn't come through yet. So that there were some option deals which I could get out of because the market changed and, and I would never have never gotten funded. The good thing is because they were options, I had the option of doing them or not. So clearly I just didn't do them those deals. I had another couple of option deals that were actually really, really good deals, but I just extended them and dragged them out, so eventually those deals came right, and, um, and I, I sort of eventually turned it all around. But 2008, I, pretty, I, was, I was like as good as bankrupt, yeah? So, that was all quite painful, uh, and I was all getting a bit bored with it, which is, and then in 2013, I um, started this training thing to teach other people how to do what I'd learned to do, um, and actually it creates a whole load of JVs and partnerships and the rest of it, which is one of the other reasons I do it, yeah? So that's it. And I also teach this stuff at South Bank University. I support, um, uh, teach advanced development valuations, right? So the point about all of this story is, is, is really just so you know, like everything I'm telling you now is because I've been there, seen it, done it, learned it the hard way. I'm absolutely guaranteed, like this, what I'm telling you now, this is how it works. And I know, so I've, I've literally been from cleaning the box to reverbing houses to head of land for the biggest developer in the country. So um, this, this is how it works. Everything works with land, 
and then the real massive key is about adding the maximum planning value. So, any questions about any of that? Yeah. Um, do you work with any historical registry about pr land prices to assess whether that land is worth buying at the time? So the way, let me just, I'm going to set my timer to see how long, I'll show you exactly how that works in a minute, just want to make sure. <coughs> Andrew, how long have we got? How long would you like? <laughs> you haven't got that long. <laughs> oh. Go till about 8.25 or something, 8.25. Okay, well I'll, I'll answer that really, really quickly, right? just, to, just to put all of this in a, in a, in a bit of context. Any errors for this? I don't know about anybody else, but I'm getting off to an otter. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It is. I thought you were going to say the presentation. You were lucky. It was going to be. Um, you're going to see what. Sorry, I was going to see my muscle come. This I'll snap shirt off in a minute. So, uh, right. How you value value land? Okay. I'm going to be. I wasn't going to be talking about it. So I'll do this really quick. So let, let's assume it's meant to be a house. You've got a, pl a plot of land with a dilapidated old house going down the pan or, or whatever, right? Every, <laughs> everything, land units, they have an existing use value, okay? So the value of the thing as it is. So let's say you go, you go away, you look at sim similar stuff, big houses on big plots, as houses are say are basically selling for let's just say a million quid, right? Just trying to make the make the numbers easy. I spot this and work out Ooh. 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 <laughs> that you can probably knock the house down, right? And <coughs> knock the house down. Stick a, stick a new road in. It's not drawn very well. And, and build, get five houses on the plot, okay? It's not drawn very well. So the question is, how do you value that? Right? So let's say, remember that was a crappy old house. These are all nice, brand new, sexy houses. You've got five of them. Let's say we can sell them a million quid as well. Yeah. Remember what we're trying to do is work out what you can pay for the land. So five times a million quid equals five million quid. So the gross development value, yeah, the, the total value that you can potentially create. Remember, you can't do this until we get planning. Is five million quid. Okay. You then need to deduct the cost of creating them because you can't sell them until you create them. So that's build costs, stamp duty, planning fees, design fees, everything, yeah, finance, your total cost of creating, creation, so I'm going to call it total development cost, just to make the numbers easy, let's call that 3 million quid, yeah, and then your target profit, you can say at 20% of GDV, yeah. So in the development industry, standard profit margins, a minimum, this is a sensible minimum, right? It's, it tends to be about 20% of GDV. So that's a million quid. So total end value minus the cost of creating them, minus your required profit margin, what's left i.e. Uh, the residual is what is what you can afford to pay for the land. Does that make sense? So that's so that's that's how value land is valued. So what's what stuff sold for historically, yeah it's sort of useful to know. But the thing is when it comes to sites, land, buildings, everything is so individual and specific 
it's, it's sort of not that relevant. It's useful to know just as a little check or a tester, but the only way you can properly value development opportunities is by going through this process in a whole ton of detail, yeah? And, and getting every single one of these costs absolutely spot on. That's, that's how you value development manager. Yeah? So, given this scenario, if you've got an existing use value of a million quid, and a, and a potential with planning value of a million quid, that's probably not going to work as an off-market deal, okay? Because what we're doing with off-market deals, we're, we're, we're finding things like this, then approaching the owners in a very specific way and saying, hello, Mr. Landowner, you've got a big plot of land. I think it's got some development potential. Would you be interested in having a chat? Hopefully they, 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 they say, yeah, you, if you're, if you're being a, a, a land agent or a site finder just looking to get these 2% fees, right? All you have to do is, is, is spot something that looks like it's got some potential. That's it. You, you don't have to know how to do any more. If whoever you introduce the site to, so let's say you introduce it to me or this was something that I spotted myself, needs to be able to be really good at this. It's, it's, it's this bit here knowing how to do that that, that, that maximises that. Yeah? So, so, the, so the, that, 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 that's the whole point. Development is all about maximising land values. The, the more significantly you can increase the land, land value over and above its existing use value, the more chance you're going to persuade the landowner to sell. Does that make sense? So, so, anyway, so, 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 that, so that's, that's how you value that. So it's nothing about second-hand stuff. It's not really about comps. You can't really do it that way. If you, if you, if you, if you want to be doing development deals yourself, you need to understand what goes into that. Because as you can see, million quid here, he's not going to be, able, he's not going to want to sell, right? But if I can get another unit or do things in a slightly different way, that that could be the thing that that makes make turns into a deal. Yeah. So that, so that knowing how to do that to maximise that. Is, is what that's all about. Yeah, planning and design. So, <clears throat> actually, I'm going to jump back a step. So, in 2012, I was sort of semi retired. I lived in Spain for a few years, a long, very long story, but I soon got really bored um, and started writing a book. And as, and as part of the process of writing the book, I did a whole load of research to ask people in the in the area of land planning and property development what is it that they really needed to know like what were, what were their biggest problems this is what they said everyone's biggest problem was that they couldn't find deals once they found deals well they couldn't work out well actually back to this right was it really a deal well it looks like it might be a deal but but is it is it a deal or not so they didn't know how to do that Importantly, they didn't know how to do that quickly and without spending a ton of money. Now, there, there, are, and there are ways of doing that really, really quickly. And, and you need to be able to do that really quickly because you can easily, you can spend a fortune assessing the deal. That's, that I literally, I look at it and people put stuff in front of me. Sometimes they've even bought it and I tell them in 30 seconds, that's not a deal. Yeah? Clearly, you need to be able to, if you are developing or trading, you need to be able to know that before you committed it to and spent serious money, right? So they need to quickly assess deals. Once you've worked out that it is a deal, you need to know how to tie it up on the best terms possible and create the optimum design that maximises the land value and therefore maximises your profit at the same time. That, knowing how to do that is, is like, is the most important part of all of property development, yeah? Knowing how to come up with the very best scheme that's gonna maximize the land value and win planning permission. Once you've done that, well, closely linked to that, it's gotta be a design that's gonna win planning permission, and you've then gotta go away to no and know how to negotiate that planning permission. Once you've done that, uh, you gotta work out who you're gonna work with, that could be contractors. If you're flipping it, it could be who you're going to trade site onto. If you're building it or refinancing it, it's who's going to fund it. So that's that. Uh, and then obviously you need to think about your exit plans. 
could be you might be flipping it, you might be keeping it, you might be building it to sell, you might be building it to refinance. What <laughs> <laughs> <Hold> on? <laughs> So, um, anyway, so what I did was, um, as part of writing this book, was, was literally work out, okay, what have I done and what do the biggest developers in the country do in order to, to do all of these things? So I spent a whole load of time thinking about it, working it out, reverse engineered it, come up with this system to answer all the questions, messed around with the names so it's spelled insider, because otherwise it's not very sexy, particularly when you can't sell something, um, and called it the insider system. But this basically, it, it, it seriously is what it is. It's literally how to like solve the whole massive development problem, answer all of those questions step by step. But it all starts with land. Oh, here's the thing. Here's a book, nearly finished. If you want it, uh, take a picture of that quick. It should eventually, after only six years, um, be ready in uh, the summer. <coughs> Actually, I'll, I'll write that here as well, I think. <laughs> right, <coughs> but so here's this as an example for real, right? So remember the, the stages land, planning, and build. So he, he's putting these things into a real example, right? So this is something I bought, um, bought in 2010, okay? So it's worth mentioning, so, so clearly it's an office building, everyone's probably gonna know about permitted development. Until 2012, 2013, converting office buildings was one of the most difficult things that you could do. They were classed as employment buildings, most of, most of the time really, really difficult to get planning for. Planners hated it. Um, which is one of the reasons the PD thing actually came in. There were lots of crappy empty office buildings around that you know, could sensibly go to residential and other uses, but planners wouldn't let you do it for various stupid reasons. All of a sudden, overnight, 2012, 2013, when the development came in, it went from being one of the hardest things you could do to almost one of the easiest things you could do. So, anyway, so this was 2010 when it was really hard. This was also in London Borough of Islington in London. All different local authorities are different. You need a different planning strategy for a different local authority. You don't do the same thing everywhere. It's like not one size fits all. Islington are, I'm going to say the worst or second worst. Islington, Bromley and Richmond. I'll do most of my stuff in London, yeah? Islington, Bromley and Richmond are the wor all are the three worst local authorities in London. So they're, they're like literally just a nightmare. They're anti-development. They hate. They hate. They pretty much everything. Yeah. So anyway, so this was in Islington. So it was always going to be difficult. I came up with an idea and had an angle for these type of buildings. So I put the word out. Someone found uh, this building. Was right up my street in terms of what I was looking for. So I'm now into, okay, how do I add maximum value to it? And the way I made ma added maximum value to it there was to convert the top two floors to residential, um, extend it a little bit, uh, and stick a new penthouse on the roof. Now, and, and the reason I had to, I couldn't do the whole thing as ready, because remember this is still 2010, planners hated it. Um, it was only, it was refurbishing the office, offices that to a large extent that swung me the consent on the rest of it, okay? Uh, I then built it and sold it, the end bit of the process, and that was one of the things that won an award, right? So that, that won the Evening Standard New Homes Awards in 2013. Mm -hmm. So for me, now, I only build stuff when, when it's something like that, because when, when I really like it, I really fancy it for whatever, particularly the last few years, I've been selling stuff, not building stuff, because even, even though I'm always finding sites off market, I'm always adding loads of value at the early stage. Well, I'm, bu I'm buying them cheaper because there's no competition. I'm then adding maximum value through planning and design. So I'm sort of up before I've even started. 
So even when I, I build them, I'm much safer because because all of that additional value I've created is effectively a bit of a buffer if things do go go a bit wrong. And then if and when I build them, I just get the build profit as well, yeah? If you buy things with planning, that's almost like the worst thing you can ever do, in my opinion. Because someone else has already added a ton of value. Anything with planning is going to be in the market. Even, even if people tell you it's off the market, you, you can't have something with planning that's not in the market. It's in the public domain. People will know about it. People will be approaching the owners. People will be trying to buy it. Anything with planning, there's going to be competition. They're just, they're just it, yeah? Which, which means you're only left with the build bit, the riskiest, most time-consuming consuming bit, to get all your value out of. So, anyway. So I, only, I would only ever build stuff when I've added a load of value early on, and I'll also only build it now if I really fancy it for whatever reason. It's a really good location, all this. There's something I like about it. I, just, I don't build everything. I probably, I prob well, certainly the last couple of years, I've been selling three quarters of my deals, yeah? I've added a load of planning value and just sold them. So that's it. So, in terms of the numbers, remember what I'm trying to explain here is, is, is the, the amounts that could be made at the, at the different stages. I, I exchanged on 80 <coughs> grand on that deal, so I tied it up for 80 grand. The people that owned it was like a, quite a commercial organisation, so they were a bit switched on, they wouldn't let me tie it up on the one pound option. But I managed to secure it for 80 grand. It was to buy it at 3.95, so just under 4 million quid. I went away and got planning to do that stuff, which, which increased the value by 1.4 million quid. So I added 1.4 million quid worth of planning value, which made it much easier to fund. Um, and because I fancied it, I built it and sold it, and I made 2.5 million quid overall, okay? But the quickest, easiest money was the lady that found the site for me, and, and got 2% of the 3.95 million quid, yeah? So that's the sort of money that could be made at the various stages. Uh, and that is it, what else? So, and that, like I say, that's the way the land market works every day of the week. So 2% introduction fees are standard. Development stuff is not right move. No developer in their right mind would ever look on right move for a site. So, sorry if any of you have been doing that, but honestly, it's, it's, it's not how it works. You, know, you, you, you just, you'd have to get lucky in order to buy a site on right move that wasn't crazy expensive. And, and if it, the only reason it's not going to be crazy expensive is if there's little or no competition, and if there's little or no competition, <coughs> you'd have to ask yourself why, wouldn't you? So. That's how it works. And so this is it. Every day of the week, this is how the land market works with, with people that are in the know, that know how to find land um, off-market sites themselves, and land agents and sources that know how to do that themselves, and then they introduce them to developers that know how to raise value. So, so that's the whole development process. Here's the course telling you how to do it. That's that. So, let me just go back to there, step right? So, what I'm going to run you through quickly <coughs> is um, how to do that first bit, finding off-market sites, okay? I'd say. So, there are uh, six key stages to it, right? First bit is, and I'm going to go into one of these in a bit of detail. All of this, the whole thing, the context is the land market understanding like the land market, how it really, really, really works. Not buying sites on white move is just a little part of it, okay? The second massive part of it is, is understanding the planning system. Because if you think about it, all, all of this is to do with planning, yeah? The more you know about planning, that's where all the value is. If you, if you can't get hold of that bit of paper that gives you permission, then, then the value hasn't been added. So, first bit is about understanding the land market. Um, and the planning system. Once you know that, it gets much, much easier to actually identify sites. And in a minute, we're going to, um, we've actually, or we can do it in the next break, we're going to go onto a bit of software and actually look for some sites in your area, right? So I'm going to show you a bit of something. We'll share out some postcodes and actually go and find some sites. So I'm going to have to speed this up. Um, 
once you've identified the potential site, you then need to do a certain amount of research to find it, finding out who owns them is the, is the first part of it, but there's, there's a load of other stuff you need as well. You then, this is one of the absolute key stages, <coughs> is how do you approach the owners in the right way that's going to get a foot in the door um, and create interest, right? So I'll tell you how it is, you, and remember, so I've tried everything over the last 35 years, including knocking on doors, throwing a brick through the window, um, anything and everything, right? Sending letters is the, is the way that works the best. It's got to be the right letter, you've got to do it in the right order, slightly different letters for different situations. So clearly I'm not the only person that sends people letters, but I'm fairly sure my letters will work better than anyone else's because I've been doing it for so long, I've seen everyone else's letters, I've tweaked them, nicked them, tested them, changed them. I've got letters that I know for an absolute fact will convert better than anything else. So how, and then of course, once you send them the letter and you get a response, you've got to know how to say the right thing, what to say, what not to say in order to get a foot in the door. If you are, and if, you, if you're being a developer yourself or a trader, then of course you need to know how to do all of this, this, this next stuff. If you're not, if you're just sourcing science to introduce to other people to either JV or for big fees, you need to find out who those people are. So if you're introducing a site to someone to get a 2% fee, or it's a potential JV partner, that you're only ever gonna get paid anything if they do the deal. So basically, you've got to establish relationships with the right people, and you've got to find and back a winner, yeah? Because if you introduce a site or you try to jump into bed with a twit that doesn't know what they're doing, <laughs> they're not gonna do the deal and you're not gonna make any money, yeah? So establishing the right people to work with is really, really key. Absolutely massive as well, if you're doing the site finding introduction fee, is, is making sure you can realize that introduction. So that's basically making sure you get paid. Okay, because with with this stuff, you're you're usually talking about big money deals. So if you're talking about you know one, two, three, four million <coughs> deals, so 20, 40, 50, 100 grand fees. In the you would not believe. Well, maybe you would. In the in the massive development world, with like some of the stuff that goes on, with, uh, like with Barrett, Sparkly, Wimpy, is is like it's real like cutthroat, nasty stuff. Yeah. So there are people out there that will do anything they can to nick your deals and stitch you up and not pay you. So making sure you protect your position and get paid if you're a site finder is clearly a really important thing. So how do you have a conversation with the right person, get your deal agreed in such a way that they can't go behind your back and nick it? I'll tell you now, it's nothing to do with non-disclosure agreements or anything like that. So, right. We're going to go back to this first bit quickly and have a look at types of sites, okay? Identifying sites. So everything we are looking for is underdeveloped. So that means the, the we can get more saleable square feet on the site or we can get more valuable square feet on the site. So if, if, you, if you think about it, if you're an office to ready conversion, even if you're not adding any more space, it's the same block, it's the same amount of space, but you're changing it from office to residential, it's underdeveloped in value terms, okay? If you're doing what I did, and you add a bit of extra space on as well, you, you'll get an extra value out of, the, out of the square footage term. So most of the time, we're always looking for things that are undeveloped, underdeveloped, um, and we're usually adding value both ways. We're changing the value and we're adding more space. Uh, another thing we always look for are non-conforming users. Non-conforming user is a planning term. It's basically something that doesn't fit in. So example I use a lot is a scrap yard in the middle of a residential area, right? It would never get planning permission today if you went and put a scrap yard in the middle of a residential area, but it's just there for historic reasons. So, so they can't get rid of it. That's a non-conforming user. <coughs> oh. Strategic land, that, that tends to be your green belt and your farms and fields. The, usually, the only chance you're gonna get planning on those is gonna be fairly long-term. So you have to promote them through the development plan process to try to get them allocated as housing. Interestingly, that's, that's actually, it's getting a little bit easier than, than, than it used to be for various reasons, but it's a, it's a, it's a different skill, that, 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 that stuff. Um, change of use is self-explanatory. 
three person conversion to self explanatory and land assembly, I really like. A land assembly is when you, you, you piece together land that's in two or more ownerships to, to get a bigger site out of it. Let's have a little look at some examples of some of those. So, cl so clearly that's underdeveloped, right? You don't need to be, I hope, a genius to realise that you know you could probably knock that down and get five stories on there, or if the building would take it, you could probably even stick a couple of stories on top of the existing building. Yeah. So that's obviously underdeveloped. This is also underdeveloped, but not so obviously. I mean, if you saw it like that, you'd think it was under that. This is where, well, this is one of the ones I did a little while ago. I'd start, already started the work. So this was old, this was retail at ground floor. So this was an old timber merchant. Had a cab office and some offices upstairs. And this is when I started doing the work, okay? So what I'm doing here is knocking down this building in the middle. So this stuff here is this building on the end. I'm stopping that falling down. There's a building here. I'm stopping that falling into the hole. And then I'm, I'm just in the process of knocking down the bit in the middle, yeah? So... The, the angle there was I spotted that, I, I approached the guy here in a very, very specific way, same as I always do, same as I teach and the rest of it. He told me he'd never ever been approached by anyone else before, developer, right? And the reason for that, I'm pretty sure, would have been that any, anyone looking at that before it started looking like this would have assumed that it was just a conversion job would have done the numbers, but just they wouldn't have seen that there was a development angle there. It was, it was like, there was, there's no angle, that's what it looked like. I realised that uh, the, these are quite high story heights. Obviously that was, a, that was an Edwardian retail story height. This was Ed, Edwardian red years ago, this was ready. Much higher floor to ceiling heights than you get today. So I realised that within that three floors, I could knock it down and get four floors. So that, so that was the angle there. And that ground floor was fairly low value, crappy space. Yeah, so, so, so it's underdeveloped in value terms and in space terms. <coughs> so, so I took three, three floors, which were fairly crappy low value, and got four floors of high value ready out of them. Yeah? So that the thing is with all of this stuff, the more you know about planning, the more less obvious angles you will see. So, there's another little thing you need to know about. Who who's knows who's come across who's heard of proposal maps? Okay. So so every local authority, wherever you are, there will there is there is a planning map for your area that covers covers the whole country. There is not a, there is not an inch of this country that isn't covered by a local authority proposal map. You need to know how to read them to understand and to know what it all means, but everywhere's got a map. This was the map for the building I've just shown you. One of the reasons I think no one else spotted that as, as a deal is because they would have seen that building and based on what uses were there and based on how it looked, they would have assumed that it was in here somewhere, right? I checked, went and checked the map and it was here. So without going into the detail, the point is that Literally, if my building was, 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 was here, was, was like fine, if I'd been there, it would have been no way. So literally, I was the right side of the line. It's a little bit more detailed than that, but the point is, there is there's a, you know, first thing you need to do when you're looking at a development site is look at the proposal map and understand what, it's, what it means. That's your starting point for development. And there's a, wherever you are, whatever you're looking at, there is a map the, the, the applies. So that's that. So land assembly. So here's a typical land assembly. Uh, like I say, I, I really, really like these because it's back gardens are typical land assemblies, okay? What happens is most of the time, look how long these gardens are, right? For most people nowadays, Look, there are some, some people that love their gardens, right? For most people, a gigantic garden is just a pain in the arse, okay? So it gets to a certain point whereby chopping that much garden off that house does, does nothing to the value of that house. It does, that doesn't devalue that house, right? Um, <coughs> and the guy's got a much smaller, um, more manageable garden. 
you know, and, and I'll probably give him 50, maybe even 100 grand for that, which is, you know, ni nice money for half your garden that you're not using, just as an example. The reason these can be really, really good is you can end up with a lot of land for not a lot of money, yeah, for doing land assemblies on gardens. Obviously, you need to know how to spot them, know what say negotiating these things is particularly tricky, um, but I really like them. So that is what I'm doing at the moment. So as you can imagine, yeah, that's a really nice little value, high value scheme on some land that I've got fairly tied up fairly cheap. So assuming I get planning for that, cuts wood, paper's type of wood, isn't it? Uh, there's, a, there's a couple of million quid land profit in that. Got to get planning, obviously, but this is my thing, yeah? How did you um, sort of tie them all up together? Because getting them all to agree and not having mm. one person do something they are now is really difficult. Um, and the other thing, from that, it's got quite a narrow connection. I've got a business plan as well. Did you talk to you about the internet? Unit. Oh. The, um, you never, there is, clearly there's a real art to do to doing this, right? One of the key things is divide and conquer. Last thing you ever want them doing is talking to each other. Because, well, you, you, can, you can guess. It's like, well, why are you getting more than me and all sorts of bullshit. So, 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 so you've got to stop them talking to each other and there is, and there is a way of doing that. <coughs> so here's another little one. This was just two bungalows. So two bungalows on small plots with another two bits of land got five big houses, so that was a super high value one. Uh, just to tell you about some other quick stuff that you may not know about. So it's obviously all sorts of stuff happening with Permitted Development, yeah? Office to Resi, everyone knows about. Highly, highly, highly unlikely you are going to get a good Office to Resi deal, right? So people like teaching courses about conversion, commercial conversions and stuff like that. <coughs> You're about five years too late, to be honest. Or, or and, and, and it's like it's a bit like any any office building um, is as good as on the market in my opinion because everyone knows what they're, they're worth four or five years ago when this first happened landowners owners of office buildings thought it thought that they were office value so you could go and tie them up for office value knowing that they're worth a lot more because you can make them ready just like that as time's gone on uh, <coughs> It's highly unlikely there's going to be an, an owner of an office building that doesn't know about PD. Yeah? So, so none of that stuff's cheap anymore. On top of that, you've got all sorts of bullshit training companies teach, teaching about how it's the next big thing and you can make a ton of money and how easy it is, which it's not, right? And, and, and you've got a whole lot of, lot of people you know, thinking it's get rich quick chasing the same stuff. Again, the, the prices get bid up. You're, ne you're not going to do a deal on that type of stuff anymore, in my opinion. You're like, you're, you're way too late. You might, you might get lucky, but highly unlikely. There's a few other bits and pieces that are less likely, or, or that, that less people know about, or less people are looking at at the moment. If you're going to look for the PD stuff, that's the better thing to look for. B8 is one of them. B8's a plan and use class. It's warehousey looking stuff. Or B1A, light industrial, looks similar to that. Agricultural stuff, you probably know about agricultural buildings, even out in the countryside, even in the green belt, you can convert to resi under permitted development in most cases. Um, so that could be good stuff. But again, what happens is, as time goes on, the more and more people get to know about this stuff, it's hard, gets harder and harder to find a deal, yeah? Uh, the next big thing is probably gonna be retail. So you probably know, or maybe you don't, that you can get permitted development for, for smaller retail. So 150 square metres of shop, you can change to residential in most places. That's small permitted development for retail. There's going to there's gonna be more larger scale retail to resi PD coming through. It's been talked about yet. It hasn't happened yet. It will, it will definitely be happening. Here's what I'm doing at the moment. This is not permitted development, but just as an example, this will get easier. So this is uh, 
this is what it looked like before. Do you know I told you earlier when I, um, <coughs> I, I first discovered that book about auction agreements and I first realised, found out about off-market sites, I started trying to like, tie up these deals and I balled up 95% of them because I didn't know what I was doing. This was not far from where I grew up, so this is one of the first things that I tried to approach. Anyway, did it all wrong, didn't get a response, didn't follow up, just left it, and that, that was the end of that. And then, probably about five years ago now, I was um, not far away. One of the things I say to people is, you should try never to go the same way twice. Because if you just go the same way all the time, you're just going to see the same stuff all the time. If you always go you know, all over the place, you take different routes, you never know what you might see. So I wasn't far from here. I hadn't been down there for years. So I thought, I'll, I'll have a spin down there, see what I see drove down there and I was literally like amazed to see this thing still sitting there, big open site in like on the edge of London, not developed, and I just couldn't believe that someone hadn't sort of done it in the intervening 20, 25 years. So this time I approached the owners again with a proper letter this time, right? <laughs> so this time obviously I did know exactly what I was doing because I've learned it all the hard way and I've been doing it for a long time. But but and then they, then they responded, and then I responded in the right way. I went to see them. I knew exactly what to say, what not to say. So I sort of got the deal done. So a big part of it was the fact that I now knew exactly what I was doing. But another big part of it was that the timing was just, just happened to be right then, whereas it hadn't been for the previous 20, 30 odd years. Probably even longer before that, because I wouldn't, you know, there would have been people trying to tie that up as a site even before me. So the point of this story is, is there's a timing element to these things as well. So, so when you know, once you know how to spot this stuff, you'll start seeing it everywhere. And even when you see stuff that might look a bit too obvious and you'll assume that oh, I won't bother, you should bother because when you do it in the right way, um, the timing might be right. Yeah? And not only that, and the other thing to know is most people that do this don't do it the right way. And I know that they don't because I talk to all the landowners that I end up doing the deal with, deals with, and I always say, because this is how you learn, right? I'll, one of the key questions early on is, have you been approached before, right? And that's one of the ways you find out where to pitch your offer. Have you been approached before? Most of the time, or a lot of the time, it's yeah. Why didn't you do a deal? Why haven't you done a deal before? You just get a whole ton of information out of them. So I, I know all the reasons deals go wrong for other people. I know all the deals, reasons deals have gone wrong for me in the past. So I, I deal with it before it happens. So always have a go, even if it looks super obvious. Uh, that was that one. If you look there, look, this is that little house there. This is after I did it. So there was no introduction fee on that because I did it myself. I approached the landowner myself. I practiced what I preach. <coughs> tied it up fairly cheap because um, there was no competition. So I added. 730 grand land profit before I even started. I could have, at that point, I could have flipped my contract. I could have assigned my option. I, I probably could have flipped it for a million quid because someone, remember, it's a site with planning. Someone would have cut their margins to buy that site. So I could almost, almost certainly have flipped it for a million quid. I didn't want it because I fancied to build, build that one. I built that one. I made uh, just under 2.3 million quid. So that is it. Very, very quickly, if you want to learn how to do that, uh, first, here is um, 1st of February in Chiswick in West London, right? And the, the thing is, I've got to tell you this, 80% of my time, I'm still doing deals, right? 20% of the time, I run a bit of training. The reason I run a bit of training is because I quite enjoy it. It creates a whole load of deals and opportunities as well. Um, and, and most other people out there, particularly around development now, are talking shy and they haven't been there, seen it, done it. And obviously, I don't like that. So for me, this is straight up no bullshit stuff. Um, I can tell you how it works. Really, really, really quickly, right? I hate, I hate this sales pitch bit. But the, I'll tell you what, the, the reason it's really important, right, I was talking to someone the other day, I, I honestly had got a duty to tell you how to do this stuff properly. It's entirely up to you whether you want to believe me or not, but 
if, if, you're gonna, if you want to carry on buying tyres on the market or in the market, you just need to be aware that that's, that that's the risky bit and you're not left with that much of the process to get, get your value out of. Yeah? And, and, and the more develop, developer -y, develop -y type deal it is, i.e. The, the riskier it gets. So on, on, all, on all stuff really, if, if, if you're just left with that bit to get your value out of, even when you're really, really good at building, um, it's, it's, you're going to struggle, particularly if the market isn't going in the right direction to get you out of the ship. Because build costs only go one way and it's not down. Right? So anyway, uh, like I say, I, ha I hate to tell this bit, here's what you get, right? I do, because I like doing it, I do two days um, non-executive directorship a, uh, a month with people and I charge 10 grand a day. Which might sound like a lot of money, but if you think about it, it's absolutely like peanuts. I can look at a deal and, and literally, who some someone here? There was this thing called the National Development Summit on Saturday in London. I, I know I've seen one person here that was there. Right? I don't know if anyone else was there. There was a guy turned up at that at that thing who um, rang me up about four months ago. I didn't really know him. We sort of friends on Facebook. I said, I, I just I've just done this deal. Um, like I'm struggling to get it funded. Can you have a look at it for me? It's just exchange on it, right? I met him in the cash, sat down, had a look at him, uh, with, at it with him in like literally just a couple of minutes there's some few things i can see about it and i uh i said mate that's that's a that's a terrible deal what did you get paid for but i literally just did, did the numbers in my head and it's only just exchanged i said you've got to get yourself out of that straight as soon as possible he said i've only just exchanged i said mate i said drop your deposit Ser seriously anyway so oh, well, i'm not sure i've got a partner on it i need to talk to my partner anyway cut a long story short he went and did the deal anyway, spoke to a whole load of other people, gave him a load of bullshit, yeah, 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 don't worry about it. Um, saw him at that thing on Saturday, um, he couldn't get the deal funded, had to sell it, uh, lost 800 grand. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and that was like one deal, and it was his first deal. I mean, anyway, what can you, what can you say? So, um, I'll tell you what we'll do. What I'm going to do is, um, we do, we've got questions and ask, answers later, haven't we? Yeah. So during the question and answer bit, I wanna, I'm want i gonna go on to um, the site finding software and I'll show you how it works and we'd like to shout out some postcodes. I'll literally go through the process, yeah? And find some sites in your area and show and show you how it works, yeah? Because yeah. I think we've got to finish now, haven't we? Yeah, where are, where and what are we gonna do, and I'm gonna, I will then finish <coughs> the sales pitch when you get a bloke. Look, there's no sound here, but that's how good it is. <laughs> that's what you're gonna look like. It's like that's it. It's what people say. So that's it. Thank you very much.